Since 2002, Arkansas and Guatemala have been joined as part of the National Guard State Partnership Program and take part in 20 to 30 military to military exchanges per year. For more information about the State Partnership Program and its important impact on supporting allied and partner nations worldwide, you can reach out to the National Guard Bureau of Public Affairs. And with that, happy to take your questions. We'll go to Associated Press, Lita. Thanks, Pat. Um, can you give us the Secretary's reaction to Senator Tuberville lifting his hold on the vast majority of the nominations? And also, what impact does it have on the department that he has suggested he would continue to hold uh, four-star nominations? What, what problems does that create? Uh, well, certainly, uh, we're encouraged by the news. Uh, we'll continue to stay engaged with Senator Tuberville and the Senate uh, directly to urge that all the holds on all our general and flag officer nominations be lifted uh, to include those nominated for four-star. Um, as you know, uh, there have been upwards of 455 nominations uh, concerning 451 general and flag officers at the Senate for consideration. Um, in terms of the number of four stars, uh, there, w there would be at least 11 four stars uh, that would be impacted uh, by those continued holds. And, and all of those positions uh, obviously are key senior leadership positions to include the vice chiefs of the various services, uh, the commander of U.S. Pacific Fleet, uh, the commander of Pacific Air Forces, commander of Air Combat Command, uh, as well as the commander of uh, United States Northern Command, Cyber Command, and Space Command. So clearly vital and critical organizations, uh, all of which require uh, experienced uh, senior leaders in those positions. Does this create any complications as some of the people move up into the three-star jobs and, and some move up into other positions? Or does this create complications with people in the same post or what do you, and what happens with those who are nominated? Yes, sure. So that, that is something that we will continue to work through. Uh, you know, th this is obviously developing, but clearly something that uh, the, the department has experience in in terms of managing uh, general and flag officers. Uh, but to your point, it's not just flicking a switch and suddenly everyone moves into these new positions. Uh, you have to consider things like um, when people can move, um, where the, the people that are moving out of the positions are going, and so all that has to be carefully orchestrated and done in a way that enables us to continue to conduct the operations uh, without having significant impact, not only on the mission, but also on the individual family members. So that'll, that will be something clearly that we'll continue to work through uh, and have more information on in the coming days. Jennifer? Pat, what was accomplished by Senator Tuberville's hold? Uh, I, I'd have to refer you to Senator Tuber Tuberville uh, to talk about uh, that. I mean, clearly, from a Department of Defense standpoint, um, we have an, a mission to do, uh, and we require senior leaders in key positions to help lead and conduct the operations of the Department of Defense. Uh, and so I'll just leave it at that. Can you be more specific about the impact it actually had in terms of the officers and their families? What ha what? Impacted yeah, it well, cl clearly, um, again, uh, as evidenced by everything that's going on in the world right now, um, we have a very uh, important mission in terms of defending this nation. And any time you add a level of uncertainty uh, into uh, the chain of command, uh, it, it creates an unnecessary friction. It has an impact on readiness as we try to stay focused on the mission, which we are going to do. Uh, and so uh, this department is... Uh, very focused on a daily basis on getting that mission done. But when it's unclear whether or not your senior uh, leaders are going to be in place at the time and place they're needed, that, of course, creates unnecessary friction and does have impact on readiness. Was there any agreement made with Senator Tuberville? What changed? Uh, I'd have to refer you to Senator Tuberville for that. Matt? Thanks, Pat. Um, I have a question about Iraq and Syria. So we know about the AC-130 uh, that struck Iran back to militants in Syria after an attack on American forces last month. And we know about <coughs> the U.S. drone that preempted an attack um, by militants in Iraq over the weekend. Uh, can you tell us how many of these sort of unplanned, swift, either counter-battery or um, preemptive strikes the U.S. has launched 
in the region since October 17th. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I don't I don't have anything else to read out to you. Um, clearly, we have and always have had the inherent right of self-defense. And so if our forces on the ground are attacked, they, it is certainly within their right to take appropriate action and respond. And so uh, in those cases, obviously, um, you know, we, we were able to highlight that information for you, but I don't have any additional updates to provide for troop safety in the region that you've talked about in the past. Should we expect more of these kind of preemptive strikes against these militants going forward? So I'm not going to telegraph uh, what we may or may not do other than to say we're going to do what's necessary to protect our forces in this particular case. Again, uh, you know, it, it, it's what I would consider a dynamic strike in the sense that they saw this attack about to happen, took appropriate action to, to eliminate the threat. And so uh, the bottom line is we will do what we need to do to protect our forces. Thank you very much. Let me go over here to Fadi. Now I'll come back to Joseph. Uh, I have two separate questions. Um, the first on uh, the Secretary's speech in, in California, where he talked in length about the war in Gaza, and, and he said that the only way to win uh, in urban uh, warfare is to protect civilians, and he personally pushed, as he said, uh, Israeli leaders. To, protect, to do more to protect civilians. Since the end of this pause on Friday, um, health authorities in Gaza s are saying that more than 1,200 civilians have been killed in Israeli strikes. How uh, satisfied is the Secretary from the way Israel is going about uh, protecting civilians in Gaza? Yeah, thanks, Fadi. So I, I can't comment on uh, the numbers that Hamas uh, the Hamas Health Ministry is is putting out, so I can't verify those numbers. Um, but what I can say, what I can, oh, can I answer your question? Uh, what I can say is that uh, the secretary wor his words speak for themselves. I mean, we will continue to consult with our Israeli partners on the importance of taking civilian safety into account. Uh, as he highlighted, not only is it a moral obligation, but it's a strategic imperative. Uh, at the same time, again, we do recognize that Israel is engaged in a very uh, difficult fight when it comes to preventing Hamas from conducting the kinds of attacks that they did on October 7th in a very dense uh, urban environment uh, in which Hamas has intertwined itself among the civilian population, in effect using them as human shields. So again, I'm not going to speak to Israel's operations. Uh, per se, other than to say that, again, we will continue to talk uh, with our Israeli partners uh, and expect them to conduct their operations in accordance with the law of armed conflict. Yeah, Thank you. On, on the numbers, just, just want to note that the UN is using those numbers and even the U.S. government, and we saw that in a hearing in Congress where U.S. officials said probably there are more. Well, wait, what you said was that uh, since the right. uh, operations yeah started again on Friday that the Hamas Ministry of Health has said to, and I just can't vouch for those numbers. They said authorities in Gaza. But what I'm saying is even the U.S. government is acknowledging that these numbers are accurate. But on the second thing issue, um, Amnesty International and UN investigation has said that 43 Palestinian civilians have been killed in two unlawful airstrikes by Israel using U.S. made weapons and Amnesty is saying these are uh, apparent war crimes. Does U.S. have any, or this apart, uh, department, any uh, understanding of how many civilian Palestinians have been killed by uh, weapons provided to uh, Israel by the U.S.? Yeah, thanks, Fadi. So as far as the report goes, we're reviewing that report. Uh, as you know, as a general matter, we don't offer public uh, evaluation, or we don't offer evaluations of public reports that are by outside groups. Uh, but again, I'd go back to what I said earlier, is that we are going to continue to consult closely with our Israeli partners on the importance of taking civilian uh, safety into account and conducting their operations. Let me go to Joseph. Thanks. Um, today, earlier today, the Lebanese army announced that an Israeli strike on a Lebanese base killed one Lebanese soldier, injured three others. It seems like it's the first of its kind. And without speaking to Israeli operations, it also comes on the heels of last week's call between General Brown and the Lebanese army chief, and, and General Brown reiterated the, the, the need to restore calm along the blue line. So uh, does the department have any, any comment or response to the attack today, which the Lebanese army until today says they're not involved in any of these combat operations? Yeah, thanks, Joseph. I, I don't have any information on, on that uh, particular report. Clearly, the Lebanese armed forces are an important partner uh, in the region. Um, 
but I just don't have any insight into that. Again, uh, as the chairman highlighted, we do not want to see an escalation of the conflict uh, along the, the northern border of, of Israel, and so I'll just leave it at that. And just to follow up on a question I asked last week, Dr. Carlin a few weeks ago said that there's a CIVCAS office here, the department's tracking civilian casualties in Gaza. Do you have any, can you elaborate at all on what, what exactly they're doing? Are there any reports that are expected to come out? I'll have to take that question. I don't have any further information. Let me go back here to Wafa and then Nancy. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, the Israeli Defense Secretary said the, or predicted that the war in its current intensity uh, may last for at least another two months. Does the Pentagon share this assessment? And will the United States uh, be providing or continue to provide Israel with the security assistance as long as this war will take? Yeah, so I, I, I can't put a timeline on an Israeli operation. That's really a question for the Israelis to address. Um, I can tell you what we're focused on, and, and you've heard me talk about this before. Number one is protecting U.S. forces and citizens. Number two is ensuring that Israel has what it needs to defend itself from future terrorist attacks by Hamas. Uh, we're also continuing to work closely with Israel in terms of hostage recovery. Uh, and then also ensuring that this crisis does not escalate into a broader regional conflict. So that will continue to remain our focus. So you, you continue to provide the assist, military assistance as long as this war will take? <clears throat> We will continue to consult closely with Israel to ensure that they have what they need to defend themselves to prevent a future terrorist attack. Uh, one more thing. Uh, can you confirm that the U.S. is flying ISR flights over Lebanon? And also, if you can tell us if you resumed the ISR flights over Gaza. I'll have to take that question. I don't have that. Nancy? Thank you. I wanted to follow up on some of the comments that um, Secretary Austin made um, over the weekend in his speech. He warned that um, that there was the possibility that in, that Israel could replace tactical victory with a strategic defeat, and so I'd like to understand is if he is if that worry is leading to any changes in terms of the types of weapons that the United States provides Israel, or uh, or how it advises Israel to prevent the strategic defeat that he warned of. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. So I'm not going to get into the the specifics, um, other than to say again we. Uh, consult closely with Israel. Secretary Austin speaks to his counterpart on a near daily basis. Uh, and part of those discussions includes the kind of security assistance Israel needs to prevent a future terrorist attack uh, in the future. Um, those conversations also include a robust discussion, as he highlighted in his remarks, of ensuring that civilian safety uh, is taken into account, as well as the importance of ensuring that humanitarian assistance is being provided to the people of Gaza. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, so the Wall Street Journal, actually, they reported um, yesterday that the Israelis are weighing a plan to flood uh, Gaza's tunnels used by Hamas with seawater. And I'm just wondering if that's something that U.S. defense officials have been told about by their Israeli counterparts, a plan that they've been consulting on and or something they would support. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd have to refer you to the IDF to talk about their operations. Thanks, Natasha. Let me go to the phone here before I get in trouble. Uh, let's go to Laura Selgum and Politico. Hi. Yes, thanks, Pat. Sorry, I hope you can hear me. I'm in kind of a loud space, but I'm just wondering um, if the secretary has uh, had any discussions or presented any options about whether to about striking back potentially um, on any of the Houthi targets um, in in Yemen or the Houthis that have been launching attacks at commercial shipping? Yeah, thanks, Laura. So um, again, I'm not going to telegraph or, or speculate on uh, potential uh, strikes in the future. Uh, as you've heard us say, we're going to do what's necessary to protect our forces. Now let's take a step back here and talk about the situation in the Red Sea. Um, as, as you've heard uh, yesterday, most likely from uh, the uh, White House in terms of the, uh, or the National Security Advisor talked about the fact that we are in discussions uh, with our partners and our allies about a maritime task force. Um, it's important to highlight that the Houthi uh, strikes against commercial vessels in international waters uh, underscore the fact that this is an international problem. 
Uh, all three of these ships uh, were uh, sailing in international waters, representing a variety of countries uh, in terms of where they were flagged and, and who they were crewed by. Uh, so those talks are ongoing. Uh, I don't have any specifics to announce, um, but I would highlight we already have the framework in place to enable such a task force through the combined maritime task force. Uh, now, the important thing to understand about that task force, uh, it's an international task force made up of 38 nations. It is a coalition of the willing, and it does not prescribe a specific level of participation from any member nation. So uh, those contributions are determined uh, from each country, and so therefore can vary depending on its ability to contribute assets and its availability to provide those assets at any given time. So. Uh, to, we, we are definitely uh, looking to take action here uh, as it relates to working with, with partners and allies uh, throughout the region. Oh, by the way, something that we've been doing for years. Thank you. Let me uh, uh, go to Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Thank you. Uh, you had mentioned some of the uh, four-star positions that remain vacant, including the head of Air Combat Command, uh, Cyberspace Northern Command, how is the department affected or how is it limited by these uh, continuing vacancies? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Well, to be clear, uh, there are people uh, in a lot of those positions. Uh, in some cases, though, they've been extended or in some cases there's uh, an acting role. In the case of the vice chief positions, to your point, uh, currently there, there would be no vice chief. So uh, it's a, a combination. Um, and then, in, again, in terms of the impact, uh, we've got a lot of work to do, uh, and you, you need to have the right leaders in place uh, in order to uh, carry out those operations. Oh, by the way, in some cases, when you're in an acting capacity, you don't have the full authorities necessary uh, to sign off on policies or to make decisions, uh, or by virtue of uh, statutes that may exist that require a Senate-confirmed leader uh, to be able to carry out certain duties. So, uh, again... Um, we've talked about this ad nauseum and the importance of making sure uh, that all holds are lifted and that nominations can make their way through the Senate. Chris. Pat, uh, there were many uh, elected uh, leaders at the Reagan Forum. Secretary Austin was there. Um, did Secretary Austin discuss um, the hold issue with any uh, senators or their staff um, at the Reagan Forum? Um, has he had any recent conversations, either in person, by phone, letter or other means that may have put a renewed sense of uh, urgency on this issue? Yeah, thanks, Chris. So I'm not going to get into the private conversations uh, that he had other than to say he did have the opportunity to engage with congressional leaders uh, at the Reagan Defense Forum. But, but look, he's been very clear on this both publicly and privately for a very long time now on the importance of lifting these holds. Thanks very much. Joe. Thank you, General Ryder. Uh, I want to go back to what you have said about the Maritime uh, Task Force. Uh, does the Pentagon believe that the GCC should and Egypt should play a role in this uh, international, yes, international-led effort? Thanks, Joe. Again, I don't have anything to announce today in terms of the specifics other than to say we do have a framework in place as it, as it relates to the combined uh, maritime force. So um, when we have additional details to provide, we certainly will do that. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, General. Um, regarding to the New York Times report uh, yesterday, um, a Hamas missile struck an IDF facility um, housing Israel's nuclear capable missiles. So do you have any um, knowledge about that attack that attack will be uh, that's happened already on 7th of October, last October? And how much does the DOD concern about impact on U.S. strategic stockpile in Israel because of this war? Yeah, thanks. Uh, as it relates to that, that news report, I don't have anything on that. I'd refer you to Israel. Clearly, though, when you take a step back, uh, and to your point, there are missiles being launched into Israel, which again highlights the threat uh, that Hamas does pose to Israel. JJ. Uh, <clears throat> sir, you, you mentioned three things that were part of the objective for sending the added presence to the region. Um, since the October 7th, uh, massacre in Israel. And the third one, which was to prevent the crisis from expanding um, to other parts of the region, given the frequency and the types of attacks and the those that have been involved, is the Pentagon satisfied that this conflict hasn't already expanded? 
Yeah, look, again, uh, what we're focused on is preventing the crisis uh, in Israel as it relates to the conflict between Israel and Hamas from expanding into the broader region. So far, it's our assessment that that has been contained. Israel is fighting Hamas in Gaza. Now, that's not to say that there aren't elements, uh, you know, in Iraq and Syria that are attempting to exploit the situation, as you've seen uh, with these rocket and drone attacks. Oh, by the way, it's not the first time these groups have done these sorts of things. So as they, again, try to use this situation to uh, advance their broader objective, which is to expel U.S. forces from Iraq and Syria, uh, again, we have a very important mission there focused on the defeat ISIS mission. It's the only reason our forces are there. Uh, they will stay focused on that, and we're going to stay focused on protecting them. Uh, as it relates to the Houthis, again, I've highlighted uh, that, that we will continue to consult with uh, international allies and partners on an appropriate way to protect commercial shipping going through that region, um, and at the same time ensuring we do what we need to do to protect our forces. Um, you've been following the, this region for a long time. You know that the Houthi forces, Houthi rebels, uh, have been engaged in conflict throughout that region for a while now. Uh, just in this case now, they're targeting inter international shipping. And so the United States, along with many countries in the region, uh, have provided a presence there to ensure international security and stability. Uh, we will continue to play an important role in that effort. Let me go back to the phone, and I'll come back to Jennifer here. Uh, let me go to Howard uh, Warzone. Hey, thanks, Pat. Um, the IDF is saying that about uh, two civilians for um, killed to every Hamas fighters. Are you tracking that 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 level of casualty figure? Uh, look again. I I don't have any uh, information to provide on specifics of casualties, Howard. Other than we know, uh, and you've heard me say before. Uh, that thousands of civilians have been killed in this fighting. We regret any loss of life, uh, and, and any loss of life is tragic, uh, which is why you see us working so hard to make sure that not only does civilian uh, or humanitarian assistance get in, but also that we're continuing to consult closely with the Israelis on the importance of mitigating any civilian harm. Jennifer? Just a quick follow-up. In terms of the freedom of navigation operations, what message should the Chinese be taking from the U.S. reaction in the Red Sea? You had ballistic missiles and drones fired at U.S. vessels. Would this be the same response in the Pacific? And what message should China take from this? Yeah, so a couple things. So first of all, uh, just to clarify, um, in, in the case uh, of what we saw over this weekend with the drones, um, those drones were coming in the direction of the Kearney which is why, you know, they took it down. I, I can't stand here and tell you that we know definitively that they were headed towards the Kearney, but they were within the threat ring and the commanders took the appropriate action to ensure that they were defending themselves. Um, every single time you're in one of these situations, you have to judge it on your own merit, which is, again, why it's important to have qualified, experienced people in command uh, in order to make sure that you're not taking actions that could potentially escalate the situation. So to your question as it relates to uh, inappropriate, unprofessional behavior in the South China Sea, again, a lot of times it's target identification uh, or aircraft identification and knowing what you're dealing with here. Uh, same thing if you're flying uh, over Syria and, and you uh, are interacting with any Russian assets. Uh, you, you need to make appropriate decisions on um, on on that situation and what the appropriate action is going to be. All that to say, all of our forces always maintain the inherent right of self-defense. Uh, and if there is a threat perceived, they could take appropriate action and we'll do so. Ballistic missiles were fired at three international ship ships and they hit those ships. If the same thing happened in the South China Sea, would the U.S. still not respond? I'm not going to get into hypothetical situations other than, again, we'll take appropriate action based on the situation. Janie. Thank you, General. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, White House uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan said the uh, United States budget to support to Ukraine run is, <coughs> excuse me, I got a little bit husky voices. Ukraine has run, I'm sorry, I'm going to do all over here. White House National Security Advisor Sullivan said that the 
United States budget to support Ukraine has run out. And he also said that uh, South Korea had supplied large quantities of artillery shells to Ukraine. So how will the budget be covered? And uh, should South Korea more artillery shells support to Ukraine? Yeah, so um, just to kind of underscore what Mr. Sullivan said, you know, time is really of the essence when it comes to Congress passing the supplemental uh, request, uh, or else we will find ourselves in a position where we're not able to support Ukraine's security assistance requirements much longer. And so we will, uh, as I highlighted at the top of this briefing, Secretary Austin, uh, General Brown will both be on the on the Hill today uh, to again uh, speak with members of Congress and to uh, highlight again, we want to work closely with them to have this supplemental pass so that we can continue to support Ukraine and meet their urgent security needs to prevent further Russian aggression. Time for a few more, Tony. Do you have the, the current figure of how much PDAF of, uh, prisoners are drawn on authority is uh, still available? And once that's exhausted, do, do the services have other sources they could tap for Ukraine? Yeah, so um, right now uh, there is roughly $4.8 billion in restored uh, presidential drawdown authority still available, um, and there is uh, 1.1 billion in existing resources available to backfill U.S. stocks. Um, so, in terms of um, funding, as I as I highlighted, without funding, we will not be able to provide Ukraine with the critical security assistance it needs uh, to protect its cities, its people, its critical infrastructure. Um, and we may reach a point where we can't sustain the current level of security assistance support to Ukraine. Uh, and our, our spending decisions are going to be informed by multiple factors, which include Ukraine's immediate needs, uh, their equipment availability, and our capacity to replenish our resources, ensuring that our aid is both strategic and sustainable. So uh, again, uh, we would just continue to uh, urge Congress to pass the supplemental. Circle back on the Amnesty International issue, and you said you we're looking at the report. Is the Civilian Mitigation and Response Force uh, unit that's in the policy shop, are they the ones actively looking at that report? Is, is this the kind of uh, report that that unit would be, is looking at to advise senior leadership here in their discussions with Israel? Yeah, so kind of similar to what uh, Joseph was asking, so I'll, I'll take that question back and, and we'll look at that holistically, Thank sir. You for the can because that's of use to the public to know that. You got it. Thank you very much, sir. Are you still working on determining how much military assistance has been say, uh, sent to Israel so far? Because you've been working on that for a couple of weeks. <coughs> yeah, so um, what, what I would tell you here, because again, I, you know, I think we've talked about previously in terms of why are you able to provide information on Ukraine, but you're not able to provide information on Israel. And so um, I have dug into this a little bit further, and, and I would say that it's it's important to differentiate the security assistance we're providing to Ukraine uh, and Israel. The Department of Defense budgeted for Ukraine, uh, which is trackable via the presidential drawdown authority announcements that we made, uh, but the situation in Israel is different. So <laughs> DOD has not received appropriated funds or drawdown authority for Israel. So instead, Israel is using its own funds to pay for U.S. defense articles and services to include State Department provided foreign military financing for some items that are sold through foreign military sales uh, as well as direct commercial sales. Uh, and so um, if, you know, Congress acts on the supplemental budget and funds are appropriated, then certainly there will be uh, an ability to track those funds, um, but Congress has yet to act on a supplemental budget request for Ukraine and Israel. And as I highlighted, it's essential that they, they do so. So uh, at this time, DOD has not been provided any funding for support to Israel, uh, and our previous funding for Ukraine is nearly exhausted. So again, uh, we would just call on Congress to pass it. Now that Israel has restarted their military campaign, this administration said that no red lines are drawn and also no preconditions on the usage of the U.S. ammunition and weapons. Is that still the case? Can you confirm? Well, again, I just go back to how we got here, right, on October 7th when Hamas attacked Israel, killed over 1,200 people, took over 200 hostages, um, 
half of which are still being held. So we understand fundamentally Israel's right to defend itself from these kinds of attacks. Um, but again, as I highlighted earlier, we also expect that Israel will conduct its operations in accordance with the law of armed conflict. And we'll continue to have those conversations uh, for all the reasons I've highlighted. And as Secretary Austin highlighted in his remarks uh, at the Reagan National Defense Forum. Let me take just a couple more from the phone. James, uh, Messenger. Hi, uh, thanks for the question. Um, on PDA funding, I'm gonna answer the first question, uh, part of the question that I had on that. On, on PDA funding, uh, and I understand if you can't talk about this because you don't want to, yeah, I, I understand you're a man who doesn't like to telegraph, but um, I was wondering when we talk about that the PDA funding is about to run out and we're not able to replenish our stocks, we're we talking weeks, we're we talking months. Is there any sort of timeline that's, you know, and, and again, I understand you don't want to telegraph to the Russians, but what does soon mean? James, um, again, you know, part of this, I, I, I don't want to get into a specific date since a lot will depend on the size of upcoming PDA packages. Uh, and again, those spending decisions are informed by the, the factors that I highlighted. Um, but the bottom line is it's going to be sooner rather than later. And so this is why, again, uh, the department, to include Secretary Austin, has made clear that we need Congress's support now to provide Ukraine with the capabilities. Uh, we, we need Congress's support now so that we can provide Ukraine with the capabilities that they urgently need to defend themselves. Okay, take one more from the root here. Yes, sir. Hi, Pat. Thanks for doing this. Um, Human Rights Watch reported, I believe, uh, this morning that satellite imagery that they reviewed uh, showed that the Israeli military uh, destroyed extensive farmland in the northeast Gaza Strip. Uh, including during the uh, recent truce when the IDF was in control of the territory in which uh, the farmland was destroyed. Um, does the department see a tactical reason to do this when the IDF is already in control of that territory? And does the department support uh, this proposition that Israeli officials have thrown out there about creating a buffer zone uh, inside the border of Gaza? Yeah, thanks. I, I don't have any information on that, Jared, so I'd refer you to the Israelis to talk about their operations. Thanks. Thanks very much, everybody.